everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Vancouver Real. I am your host today, Mike Zaremba, and doing another solo podcast. And I know we've had quite a few of these in the in the in the in the mix lately, but uh, it's just how it is. We're, our schedules are kind of asynced right now, Andy and I. So, um, but I'm really happy to squeeze this one in because this is going to be very fun and very cool, uh, spontaneous one that just came about within the last 48 hours. So. Be, uh, buckle up, folks. Um, as always, we're podcasting here at a float house, 70 West Cordova Street in downtown Vancouver, BC. And uh, floathouse.com or .ca is our website. So come check us out. Uh, learn about flotation therapy. Learn about sensory deprivation tanks and how going into this very unique, one-of-a-kind environment can have a plethora of incredible benefits and experiences for you to uh, to you for you to have both um, from a mental health perspective but then also like a meditative exploration perspective so whatever fits your fancy there's a lot here for you and a lot of offer even in just doing nothing uh, preferably speaking um, so check out floathouse.ca and use the promo code recovery and you'll save 20 percent off a single float and I'll also have a quick shout out for Omega Point YouTube channel. Our brother Omid Pakbin from Omega Point helps us behind the scenes with the editing of Vancouver Real. And he uh, he does this really cool YouTube channel called Omega Point. And he actually features um, sound bites from various lectures featuring Terrence McKenna, Ram Das, Tim Leary, Richard Albert. Who is Ramdas, Ram or, or is and was. <laughs> Who's the other guy he has that I always get confused with Richard Albert? I don't remember. Uh, Joe Rogan's in there, Graham Hancock. So really, and he matches up all these cool verbal uh, anecdotes and puts them into a impelling, compelling video, and they're really awesome videos. So go check out Omega Point on YouTube, and his Facebook page is a really cool source of, of, of a feed as well. So um, go give it a like on YouTube. And finally, I just want to make um, kind of a, a unique plug for, not even a plug, just an announcement or an opening it up. One, just recognizing the unceded Coast Salish lands that uh, Vancouver is on. The um, Musqueam people, the Salewa Tooth, and, um, oh man, the Squamish, excuse me, uh, are the, the tribes of this nation here. And um, I, I really want to bring this up now because of, specifically what's happening in Standing Rock um, uh, out in North Dakota for the, the, the Dakota pipeline issue that's happening there right now. And personally, this has struck me really intensely the last four days and seeing how it's escalated and where it's at now. And I had a really strong emotional reaction to it personally. And I was literally up all night one night planning, how can I drive down there and support? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was very, I've never had quite the visceral reaction that I've had um, for causes such as this with this one. And it's been a shift in me and um, it's really important. And I think it's a very interesting one to be watching just because of its magnitude and its intention now. And no matter what happens, it's been an incredible um progression towards the right direction of mm -hmm. awareness mm -hmm. and so just my heart is heavy right now with what they're going through and i want to make that acknowledged on air and if you're not really familiar with what's happening down there maybe just do some light research online and get informed because it's really important and, and if you feel compelled to support i encourage you to do so so my heart is with the uh, first nations people in, in standing rock and for everything else that's representing in terms of indigenous rights um, environmentalism and and just you know shifting from a more to more of a sustainable future that is harmonious between all people and so that's what I wanted to say but um, I'm shifting again I'm going to try to shift uh, from realm to realm here and I'm really excited to to welcome into uh, Vancouver Real Studios Dr. Bruce Damer I did not <laughs> think this would ever happen. Um, I've seen you on di different podcasts before. I've seen you in your TEDx presentations that you've had at TEDx Santa Cruz, which are uh, the content is what we'll get into a little bit of today. Uh, I've met you at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference that we just had here at UBC uh, this past weekend. 
And, uh, and I've seen you there in the conference before last year. And so and I have to admit, man, you know, I didn't know how I could approach you and, and don't take offense to that. It's just like you're, when I hear you speak, um, it definitely, you describe these things as endo trips. And, uh, sometimes when you speak, I go into my own little endo trip, mm. just listening to you talk, which is really cool. I'm like, I don't even know what I would say to you, man. And so I'm really happy that our friend Adam introduced us and uh, got us connected. And lo and behold, here you are. So welcome to Vancouver Real, Bruce. Thank you, Mike. Awesome, man. Um, And I'm really glad, too, we had the chance to uh, have a little drive around Vancouver today just to kind of chat and, and, you know, get to know each other a little bit more. Um, And I guess... Actually, I'm going to read a little bit what I have on your website here, just so people have who who haven't heard of you before um, have a little background on you. And uh, you're actually Canadian American multidisciplinary scientist, designer, and speaker. So you were born in in Victoria, Victoria, yeah. okay, Royal Ju- Jubilee Hospital. There you go. Yeah, and raised in Kamloops. All right, uh, and then went to the United States <laughs> in when Pierre Trudeau was leaving office in 1985, okay. and right. now there's his reincarnation is back. Yeah, that's right. I know. It's, it's funny how the world works like that. <laughs> yes. Um, and just going on here, you work in evolutionary biology, researching the question of the origin of life and the exploration and economic development of space. And you're going to see how these two are connected because it's really cool. He also, you also have a practice in the design of innovative software systems, interfaces, and a passion for collecting and curating historical archives and computing history and leading figures of the counterculture, such mm-hmm. as like Timothy Leary and Terrence, Terrence McKenna. McKenna. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you've been, um, I mean, you, you, you've opened up a couple of stories this past weekend, even like you... You had quite the friendship with Terrence McKenna. Like you guys were confidants, and you, you introduced to each other and opened each other up in different ways. And we did, yeah, and very brief at the last two years of his life, actually. Oh, okay. And in in some sense, I was there with the group uh, to help see him out, hmm. and then we reconstructed him later. So he he passed in two thousand, and then around two thousand four or two thousand five, I woke up and bolt up right in bed one night. This happens to you know all of us, right? And said into the ether, uh, Terrence, you left too soon. I'm bringing you back. Whoa! And it became an obsession, and it started with cassette tapes, trialogues, the the whole trialogues right. tapes from Ralph Abraham. Ralph brought those over, and Lorenzo Haggerty of the Psychedelic Salon podcast, which was then new. Uh, came over and we digitized 90 cassettes on boom boxes. Wow. And that dumped uh, this huge load of Terrence, Rupert, and Ralph into cool. the the Salon podcast. And then I came into contact with Timothy Leary's estate, hmm. and we took uh, we were given the, uh, the reel-to-reel uh, recordings wow. uh, from the 60s. And you're talking about his 1964 Cooper Union speech, which some consider launched the 60s that, you know, really? that, uh, in some ways. And um, so we were able to provide that, and we sort of reconstructed both those guys for the next generation. So in the salon, there's probably 300 Terrence talks and yeah. 100-plus Tim Leary. Yeah, it's incredible. That's where I have definitely been able to absorb the vast majority of my Terrence McKenna um yeah, insight, lectures, if you will, uh, verbiage from the, from the Psychedelic Salon podcast. And if any of you haven't heard of Psychedelic Salon podcast, get on it. It is one of my favorites by far. Amazing people that uh, Lorenzo gets on that. And, and, from, and I didn't know that story about how you guys yeah. made it digitized and made it available. I didn't know yeah, you were part we, of that. It's really cool. Humpty Dumpty, you know, and, and eventually it ended up being some close to 400 cassette tapes. Right. Because there was no digital recording, so... It all was like the Grateful Dead, right? It was all recorded right. uh, by people or sometimes for sale, but sometimes mm-hmm. just casually. And we have we have put Terrence back together. It's literally. Yeah, literally. For a whole new generation. And, um, and I mean, maybe so there's some people here who probably have never heard of Terrence McKenna. I mean, I didn't take this here, but having someone that's been kind of intimately connected with them, can you maybe just tell people who Terrence was and... He was. Why a, we're talking about him like this? He was an elvish 
Uh, <laughs> Reed, totally was. He was he was an amazing guy. I mean, he was, grew up in the 1950s in Colorado, but then he was a seeker of the weird. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only from amazing science fiction, but you know, agates and effervescent, you know, uh, insects, the butterflies, butterflies, uh, you know, uh, and he was a seeker of the weird and the, 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 what was under the surface. So, you know, he came into psychedelics by, he was in Berkeley in the sixties in the late sixties. And so went that way, but then he and his brother went down to the Amazon and in search of what we now know as, as ayahuasca they found the mushroom or the mushrooms found them and then they had this incredible experience which came out as a in a book called the invisible landscape mm. and so those fellows actually learned how to grow mushrooms uh, reliably and they wrote a grower's guide which then spread that so it incent I, I i i have a term for that they insporulated the west <laughs> Very good term. um but then so that's one thread and I got to know Terrence and uh, his archive was destroyed in a fire in the, the Esalen office in Pacific Grove mm. in 2007 and at that point uh, Lorenzo and I said okay the elves have taken the incriminating evidence we need to re reconstruct Terrence because the new generation can hear him the good the bad and the ugly because there's some elements of Terrence that were not necessarily that helpful and not just the 2012 thing which right. I had long conversations with him about mm -hmm. basically saying, you know, you've got to be kidding. Uh, but anyway, uh, enough said about Terrence, but that's... Yeah, cool. You know. Well, And thank you for sharing that because, uh, yeah, he, he's been one of these guys that has been reborn on the internet. And, um, and there's so much material out there now of him and with really cool ideas that hold up uh, you know a good chunk of them hold up today mm -hmm. or and almost like have been prophetic they've been prophesized by him in a weird way like when he's made different connections and potentially from discussions with people like yourself about how the internet's going to change things mm -hmm. and virtual mm -hmm. reality and these sorts of things and that's another part of your background is in software systems and in, in development there like so folks just hold, hear me out for a sec i mean bruce you have a phd and sorry what is your phd in again it's in a kind of weird type of computation where you're trying to simulate nature okay so we're, we're doing oh. ricocheting molecules in their huge numbers it actually grew out of this understanding of terrence and i'd have conversations about novelty right you know that's why i called my own podcast the levity zone because i would tell terrence that we have enough novelty we need more levity that's right yeah um, and that's but, on damer.com damer.com yeah fine d-a-m-e-r.com -E more of letters. this stuff is there yeah. uh, but i would have these discussions with him because he was a believer in technological singularities so uh, which always struck me. They were a science fiction idea in a, in a book by Werner Vinge, mm -hmm. um, this idea of a singularity. Uh, and it's a very popular sort of Hollywood theme that machines will somehow become intelligent. It's been a, a theme since the 19th century. Mm. Now we look back upon Frankenstein and we think how ridiculous that they thought that gears and pistons could be used to make an intelligent being that could function in the world. I think people in 50 years will look back on us saying how ridiculous that they thought that, you know, JavaScript code and Unix servers could be used to make any kind of emergence or intelligence. So one night I had a long conversation with Terrence and said, basically, there's your Mac. Because Terrence didn't have technical training. He would read these articles and he would have his experiences and then come up with these notions but he didn't have any training and he didn't have in a sense critical thinking he was putting out an idea because it was a good story and dennis would say often dennis mckenna his brother who was a scientist right. would often have these debates same kind of debates with his brother and i said to terence understand that computer that's sitting there is in no way comparable to this glass of water that's sitting by your pipe <laughs> You know, Interesting. Yep. that glass of water has a rich physics of bouncing ping pong balls, basically, where nothing's happening mostly. But it's the rich physics of that bouncing ping pong ball world that allows you to build emergence. 
computational systems can't do that. And that's why we've never seen a true emergent phenomena ever happen in digital computers and possibly never will. I, I mean, for me, that's kind of how I've, like, because this, this is a very popular notion. Like, this is still like, mm -hmm. really huge out there online and stuff is the notion of, uh, of how... Yeah, machines will become intelligence and become and take us over, or whatever their their prophecy is, or the singularity, this merging. And um, I don't, I never really got on. It never felt right to me. Right. You know, it didn't. I'm like, I look around and I think the analogy of looking at nature and its processes, processes, and like how incredibly elaborate and like we were talking in the drive here how perfect they are yeah I'm like you can't that is the best technology and that was four billion years and and a, a, a system of selection and, and brilliant innovation that exceeds our wildest imaginations right. that that happened so when i was 14 i decided to take on this question of the origin of life and part of it was uh, I, there were no computers in our town in Kamloops about that time. There was no personal computers, etc. So I did it all in my head. I was doing these computational models and thought experiments in my head. Then I designed board games, mm -hmm. complex board games, where you have little rotating pieces, and I actually made all the pieces to kind of explore making a complex world. And then when I discovered computers, I realized you can make a world in here. Mm -hmm. And that led in the 90s for me to help organize the entire virtual worlds movement, which came after VR. So VR was the late 80s into the 90s, and it was head mount displays, kind of like the Vive is today. But it crashed and burned, and right. it was crashing and burning around 1994. I formed a new organization in 95 that powered up just as multi-user worlds were coming on the internet without a head mounted display. And they were the precursors to multi-user gaming cool. or to things like Second Life or Minecraft. Right. So those first generations, I, I organized conferences and I wrote a book about it uh, to get all those people together. It was the birth of a new medium. Mm. That's actually how I met Terrence because Terrence saw that and somebody told Terrence, this is the maven mm. of avatars as Bruce Damer. You mm. have to meet him. And so Terrence came over to my house in 98 and I sat him down in front of a screen and put him in world. Wow. And these were all over modem connections, but they were rich. There were, you know, a dozen platforms and people were building cityscapes in 3D and they were talking with their own voices and incredible explosion of a new medium. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then, um, but let's take this back because you kind of started like the origins of life um, portion there. Like, so when you were really young, you would run these thought experiments and how did that one kind of like come into you and also start to like really become a major trajectory or focal point in your life? Mm -hmm. So I thought it was the coolest, nerdiest problem you could ever work on. I watched a little plant, a mariposa lily coming up through the frozen ground in Kamloops right. and said, what algorithm, you know, what method is making this plant grow from something smaller and then i had this huge mind expanding experience just standing there grokking nature like you talked about walking in the forest mm. thinking wow this whole thing is driven by some kind of incredible process how did that whole thing if you if you roll time back all these seeds and plants and animals all compress down into one thing right there was an original origin right and that origin was a bunch of things that self-organized out of like chaotic bouncing things. And then I had the first thought experiment, which showed this ball of molecules kind of ratcheting around. I could see it in the sky in front of me. And before I could ask it a question, because you, you should be able to ask thought experiments questions, um, it asked me a question. It said, mm -hmm. figure out how I made a copy of myself. And I had this flash, you know, like Malcolm Gladwell's blink, and I blinked. But I said to it, it's not possible because you, if you're, you, you want a TR7 automobile, you need a whole factory to make it. You need a big machine to make a copy of any machine. I don't see any big machines around. And it winked. Hmm. And that was 
work on it. It said, work on it. So I worked on it and I built artificial life software. I organized four conferences, one of them with uh, Richard Dawkins in oh, Cambridge. Wow. And so I could meet all the people that were thinking about emergence and evolution and the origin of life. And then did a whole PhD to simulate bouncing ball worlds. Uh, running at UC San Diego, we ran the, the Evolution Grid project that was 2008 to 11, found the formula, found the, I call it the cosmic wiggle. It's the formula for the um, assembly of things by connecting them. So you have random molecules or random atoms bouncing around where they're, it's so noisy and so hot and so diffuse that things just don't ever happen. We found the formulation by which if a single bond forms in the soup, it actually predisposes the soup to form more bonds. Even though you're hitting it with heat and shaking it and everything, they don't break. Mm. And that this is how the universe uh, creates complexity. It assembles all this beauty and all this variety. And it's, it's called a stochastic hill climb. And a, a better name for it is the cosmic wiggle. Uh, Karen, Terrence used to talk about the cosmic giggle. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, so the cosmic wiggle, so discovered that in the PhD work, published that in my thesis, defended my thesis, uh, and then went on to say, I think I'm ready now to really tackle this origin of life question, but I can't do it with computers. Computers are too slow and they're not, you know, we just proved that. I went into chemistry, met David Deemer at UC Santa Cruz, who's a renowned lipid chemist. He's in his late 70s, the discoverer of nanopore sequencing. You know, major dude, but a gentleman. Mm. Gentleman scientist, has a home lab and has a lab at UC Santa Cruz. We met and spoke twice a month for five years to work this out. I did my thought experiments of cycling little protocells and hydrating and dehydrating pools, which is his model, his place okay. for where life could start, which is where Darwin thought life started. Right. And then I did the thought experiments, like when I was 14, to say, well, what happens when the bubbles peel off from the bathtub ring and go into solution and they contain the polymers and then the polymers come down and they're, the polymers keep the bubble from popping and then they collect at the bottom and there's this population of non-popped bubbles Oh, they start communicating. Metabolism happens. Oh, the gel at the bottom of the pool is the common ancestor for all life. Hmm. And I went rushing off to Dave and look at all of this is coupled. It's one system. It's an engine. It's a Genesis engine. And it can be done chemically in the lab. You can actually make these things and run them. And we've been doing that for years. And we've been growing RNA from scratch. This, this is technique. So the initial, when you have that, that community forming of these bubbles, these lipid bubbles, I, is what mm -hmm. and with different polymers being like... Accidentally trapped in them. And so is it by chance then? It's initially by chance. And for nerds out there listening to Vancouver Real, mm -hmm. here's how it works. You have a simple computer that all it can do is write a random scribble of code. So in, in order for that computer to boot itself up, uh, it can run the code, but if the code fails, it just throws the code away and runs another random one. So it writes its own bootstrap, but by doing trillions and trillions of tries and continuing to run them, that's a way of booting a computer up. It's an inefficient way. You know, in, in if we had a Altair computer in the mid 70s, we would write a nice paper tape, which had the instructions that would boot the Altair and have it talk to the screen and the keyboard, right? We would just do that. Right. But nature was a random coder, but it simply coded and coded and coded until one worked. It's a funny concept, but it's like the no-brainer concept for how life started. Right. So, so it, it's because that, you know, according to this model, uh, that random coupling that kind of started the whole thing mm -hmm. is what has come it led to, to all be... this. It led to all this, but there was a magic thing in the middle, which was cooperation and sharing, mm. which is new. It's not new to science. It's new to maybe society and politics and economics because we're <laughs> sold on this, this survival of the fittest and separation. It's what Ram Dass talks about. It's what Eckhart Tolle talks about. All of the great 
you know, people. Talk about separation. Why? Because we don't actually understand how life really works. And if science and this model works, we will show that life started as a communal unit. It didn't start as single individual competing cells because it couldn't. If cells are competing, that means they're pretty darn high tech. Right. These are much simpler. They had to cooperate and share tools and share innovations in this gel, in this what's called a progenote for a long time. And there would be a community of these gels at the bottom of one pond they get washed by rain into the next pond, learn something new in the next pond that maybe is more acidic, and then some of them are washed back into the original pond and they donate the new tool set to that, and it's called horizontal gene transfer, and it mm -hmm. drives bacterial evolution. And it turns out, we believe, that those gels just learned and learned and learned, and they had to be able to survive under rocks, in lake shores, wherever there was water and air, and mineral interfaces, and eventually the seashore, which is the toughest environment. This is why we believe life can't start in the ocean. Mm. You got salts, you got tides, you got dissolved iron back there four billion years ago. Really, really rough. So by the time they're able to flow downhill to the seashore and survive and become what are called the marine stromatolites, right. um, you know, they're really pretty, pretty advanced. Right. And I went to Australia to work with geologists in July and brought back a, which the rock that you saw yesterday, yeah. the other day, uh, a piece of stromatolite 3.49 billion years old, which is these textures in the rock kind of like, look like tree rings. And that was from a hot spring. Hmm. And so geology or the oldest surviving crust is now backing us up that yes, life started in these little freshwater pools with this engine, with the pool refilling and drying and refilling and drying and refilling and drying. That's the Genesis engine. That's the simple computer. Wow. And within our lifetimes, uh, we should be able to start growing progenotes in little dishes uh, with a camera like these Logitech cameras mm -hmm. pointed at the dish as it goes through the cycling of drying and wetting and stresses and new food stocks and amino acids and stuff. Watch that little gel grow out and then shrink because something happened in the system that crashed it down and then it grows back. You take a pipette, take a little bit of it and sequence it and find out what molecule evolved. And when those gels are grown, when the progenotes are being grown and stressed and one of them generates a pigment so it goes black mm. suddenly and you realize we found the ancestor mm. and the, we found what is us and it'll, it'll create an opening in the mind of human beings like, this is how we began. This is our common ancestor, putatively, you know, because can't really know. Right. And then you realize, holy cadoodles, your mind opens and you realize the whole planet's still doing the same thing. A tree is this thing, stromatolites. A tree, soils are this little progenote just covering the whole planet. And it's one big cooperative system called Gaia which got so powerful that it was able to prevent the Earth from dying. Because mm. all these rocky planets, most of them probably die. Mars died a horrible death. Mm. If there was life there, it was never strong enough to prevent the death of its world, which is a sad thing. Mm. Earth almost died many times. Gaia got stronger and stronger so that eventually the thermostat that controls the temperature of the atmosphere got under control of the finger from life. So it could never get too cold or too hot. It, it could emit, It could change the gas composition. Right. And that that took two, three, three billion years for Gaia to get control of the climate. Right. And we live in this balmy, beautiful world with complex beings because of three billion years of work of this cooperative, you know, sharing system called the microbial mat world. So that, yeah, so basically you're describing like a, a, an earth of two or three billion years of this, these little slimy, slimy thingamajigs. And this producing the atmosphere the oxygen, over time. Yeah, it's, it's putting that oxygen out and it's a byproduct. But that oxygen is, has to first rust all the iron. So there's a lot of iron. It's filling the oceans. It's on the lands. And that's why that, that uh, stromatolite I showed you the other day is red. 
Mm. Uh, it, it has to fill that buffer, and it takes 2 billion years to do that. So finally, oxygen can be free in the atmosphere. Then finally, you can have complex life with bodies because it has this oxygen to drive it. You know, we, we, we you know, light fires and right. we burn petroleum and drive cars because oxygen is available to come in and, and create the, the oxidization for burning a gasoline and right. flying an airplane. Without it, can't do technology, can't, can't breathe. Yeah, you know? well, even the oxidation processes of our bodies, right? Like yeah. The, the mitochondria in our cells. That's, they need it. They're the oxidizing engines that combust. Yeah, yeah, and, and all of that energy. had to have the, the un, untellably long labors of untold numbers of organisms to make that happen for us Right. in a cooperative matrix. And that's, so that's the kind of the key thing that I think is really neat is like how you're hi highlighting this cooperative nation or nature of these cells versus like, it wasn't because this one was stronger that it outlasted the other ones. It's because it got stronger because it borrowed something from somebody mm -hmm. else and then mm -hmm. it shared it with somebody else before it got yeah. you know, overtaken and, and it, or something. They were living together in a, com in a commune, right. uh, together initially the bubbles of the progenote, but then... Um, when you had land plants, you know, a forest, a tree grows tall, it shades other plants, but it drops leaves to, to feed the ground. Mm. You know, here in Vancouver, they're, they're clearing, clearing leaves up and they're putting them in bags and taking them somewhere else. So all those soils and things right. don't, are deprived of that gift back from trees. So they have to put fertilizer on. Right. And sort of the weird things we're doing to Gaia is like, Guy says, why on earth are you picking up those leaves and taking somewhere not to burn in this case these days, but, yeah. you know, are you nuts or something? And yeah. then you're putting these fertilizer and you already have the fertilizer. It's the rotting leaf mass. Right. And you know? that's, that's kind of like the whole the permaculture movements coming back to is like, yeah, how do we use the systems of nature that are proven over billions of years mm -hmm. uh, with our with our livelihoods? Because you're right, we kind of got... We started manipulating things so much, and then as our population grew, these manipulations started to it starts to create unbalance with yeah. the oceans, with the atmosphere, and with the. And I had a vision just last month, mm -hmm. uh, which might interest you and Always. your listener. The vision was the following: so I, I was driving home from the Symbiosis Festival, which is another big California wonderful festival by a lake shore, just beautiful. And I asked the question, what does Gaia feel uh, of what we are? Mm. And I went into a state of, luckily I wasn't driving, my friend was. So I went into sort of a reverie and like, how would Gaia feel humanity? And if Gaia is a microbial mat, right? That's pretty much what it is. You know, forget about cat, LOL cats and stuff. Not really part of Gaia. Gaia's slime molds. You know, ringworms, soils, that's the, the bulk of of the biosphere, right. plants and right. plankton and stuff like that. And Gaia's sensing network, if it has a consciousness, it's about a felt sense and a chemical sense. It's not visual. Like it's not like geometries and sacred geometry. None of that. It's it's what is impressed into its body. So suddenly uh, I had said to the question, how can I see the world without, not through human eyes? You know, let's just come down to, and the answer came really clearly. Well, let, let the human constructions disappear and what's left. So suddenly the road that we were on vanished. Well, like, this is why I wasn't driving. <laughs> the road we were on vanished and said there was this, this little dish, uh, that went on and on and on and on and on. And underneath it, it was very anoxic and dry because there had been pavement there and the, the kinds of life were kind of had to adjust to the fact there was bitumen and there was base rock and, and everything. But this, this thing went on forever. And then there was a gas station. It vanished. And there was a square where the tanks were and the gas station. And the vision left the concrete block there because it was mineral. Mm -hmm. And the concrete block was continually sucking up water because those concrete seems to do. And I realized this is how Gaia feels us. It's by our impressions, our boot prints, mm. boot prints in Gaia, into the land. So then I pulled back, did my whole, my whole endo thing. This is not 
taking anything particular. Right. It's just my endogenous, you know, little kid kind of imaginal worlds thing. And then I said, okay, let me talk to Gaia. You know, let me get a microphone or get a phone connection to Gaia and say, how does this feel to you? All this patterning. And the feeling back was, it's very strange to us. Mm. I said, well, have you felt things like this before? And it says, yes, let me show you. Asteroid impact, boom, huge blowhole, thousand kilometers wide, has happened so many times to Gaia, especially in the old days. Right. Lots and lots of these little craters. We felt those. But what they would do is they blow down, kill us locally, but spread ash and food would be made around. So we would then grow back in and those holes would fill with water, which would feed the community. So we learned that those blow holes, which just kept coming, there were more at the beginning and then fewer. Uh, we, we got used to that. We adjusted to that. Then there was a time when uh, everything got cold. Mm. Ice co covered the whole earth. We almost died, but we adjusted to that. We waited for the volcanoes. We could feel the heat coming up. We knew we would be saved. This happened a lot. The earth froze over. But you guys, you know, what we're feeling now is this patterning we can't figure out. The tree roots can't connect to the other tree roots because something's cut through them. And the mycelia can't connect the tree roots to the tree roots. And there are these weird scoriated patterns all over our body basically but we're adjusting but it's happening very quickly this is so quick we don't adjust we can't adjust in the way we used to adjust to the other things mm -hmm. it's it's a challenge for us it's a stress it's causing some evolution and some insight because the patterning is interesting to us it's just so fast it's a shock to the system so it's not bad or nor good. It's weird. It mm. feels weird what is going on. This is how in this vision, how Gaia feels the impact of technology and, and human beings. And it's like boot prints. It's like you're lying there and suddenly creatures march over you and leave all these impressions in, in your body. Right. You know, what do you do? Yeah. And so it's that's really, really interesting kind of perspective, like how... It's, it's happening so quick in the, you know, in terms of the scale of Fast. Gaia. Just of, in, of it's like the spider evolution. web went. Right. And, and it's such a different stimuli than, say, um, a big meteor impact, that's even even if that's thousands they, they of They got miles. used to it. They got right. used to like, that. <laughs> got used to them. So many of them happened. Huh. But there was enough reset. There was enough time to reset. The whole right. system adjusted to that. And the system will adjust to this too. However, now we have this impact of not only we are kind of webbing up this world and cutting its communication lines that it will, you know, if, if given enough time and the ability, it will totally adapt. However, now we're changing the atmosphere and mm -hmm. we're cutting mm -hmm. down the trees mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. the, you know, we're affecting the cities of the ocean so much that like, so it's, we're like kind of taking away its time to adapt. Because now, I, I, there's another side to the story, all right. which was another endo trip, which means endogenous, which means I just right. close my eyes and I'm in a reasonably good state and I go on a journey. Yeah, and this and, is actually, from hearing you talk about that endo trip form, I want to just chime in. Like, that's what I'm going to start kind of practicing more in, in the float tank when I'm not going mm -hmm. in there just for relaxation or whatever. It's like go in with a specific question or intention of like exploring it at that really deep level of inward stillness or whatever it is, you know, and working what, with the mind. What, the technique I find that works is like tuning an old-fashioned te television. Okay. So when you're finally, your mind is sort of uh, relaxing, it's not thinking of tasks and stuff anymore, it's not in like a cognitive space, then you start noticing the color patterns, hmm. shapes and stuff moving, especially in, in a float tank. Right. <clears throat> They're like little stars that whirl by and stuff like that. Um, what I then do and what I've done since I was a little kid was I just love those the little visual trinkets. Sometimes they're called hypnagogia, mm -hmm. but they're actually a gateway. And they're actually probably, uh, if you're very stimulated, they're probably dimethyltryptamine. In your brain, you're just seeing a visual 
mm-hmm. effect of it. Probably other chemicals too. Sure. They're hitting the visual cortex. But I then start tuning my TV. So I turn off all the noise. I become a separate little observer, like the TV watcher. Nothing else on my mind. Don't have to mow a lawn. Don't have to do anything. And just take it in. Just take it in. Just love those cartoons. Saturday morning cartoon. Just love it. Just be, be the open little kid looking at the TV. And then it will open. More show will come. And then the more minimal you get, the more potentiatable it can be. And if you have an intention, like my intentions were to talk to Gaia about this whole problem of us cutting down the forests, um, stuff can come back. And is it invented from our imagination? Is it the subconscious? Is it some delivery from outside? Who knows? But the teachings for me have been incredibly useful. They help me work on the origin of life and computer systems and complexity theory and spacecraft design. It's like, I'll take it, you know, because <laughs> yeah. I, I, I call it going across the liminal ridge, the liminal boundary into the magic. So you, what you really want to do, and all great mystic scientists who, and mystic artists, technologists who changed the world were mystics. They would allow themselves to go across that boundary into a magic world where things would be delivered. You know, Newton, Isaac Newton did it, Albert Einstein did it, etc. You're in the magic world. What you, what I like to do is take an intention, like a design or an idea or an intention, across the liminal boundary into the magic and have the magic work it. Either peer review or give me new insights or take it apart and say, you know, it's all nonsense. And then take that uh, result back across the boundary and turn it into the language of science or technology or a painting or a story or whatever and present it to us, our world, and see how it takes. And it usually takes pretty well. Interesting. And then do it over and over again. And that's kind of like uh, what the idea Terrence would have of bringing an object back. Yeah, the jewel. Right. You know, and Alex Gray brings his artwork back. Right. We were talking about that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you, um, the other side to this this endo trip journey, then. So I, I interrupted you. The there. other side was I wanted to ask Gaia if she minded uh, the fact that I said, "Do you mind that we're cutting down all the green, and we're running a sieve through the ocean, and we're taking all the life out, and we're just doing all this stuff?" And her answer was, "No, as long as you uh, build your dream machine, whatever that is, to give me a new home." The whole idea here is the biosphere, Gaia, whatever it is, needs to reproduce. It's the the whole drive of life is taking those cells and making two, or the organism and making the next child. Mm -hmm. So the biosphere needs to reproduce. Why does it need to do this? Because we're running out of time. Uh, According to James Lovelock, in 100 to 200 million years, the Terminator will engulf the earth. And the Terminator is this mad, you know, imaginary line where the, as the sun gets hotter on, this, on, its, you know, on its main sequence journey, um, the atmosphere will go to a state where we have one and a half watts of energy per square meter instead of 1.35 watts, which by his calculations, and you have to take him seriously, uh, the atmosphere cannot have any CO2 at all or we go to greenhouse runaway. Hmm. Forgetting human impact, we have zero. So in 100 to 200 million years, we're going to become Venus and join our sister planet, Venus, which is 900 degrees at the surface. And, you know, if any life ever existed there, it's deep underground. So, and Mars died by getting cold and dry, Hmm. losing its atmosphere. So planets are, die. Right. And they die during early on, they can die later. And there will be nothing that life can do to adjust to, to keep the system alive. So perhaps we are this reproductive organs, you know, got to have a date you know, kind of thing. We're driven hard. And Gaia does not mind in this, in this thought experiment. Gaia said, no, I, I don't mind as long as you allow me to reproduce so that we can go on with this experiment because we're rare. We're extremely rare. Complex life is incredibly rare. Right. I don't think we're being visited by any any complex aliens in rubber masks. Mm-hmm. So I said, what do you want to do? And she said, take take me. So 
we did a, this is on another airplane flight with my noise canceling headphones. We flew to the moon and I've, I've modeled so many environments for NASA, all the missions, uh, my brain is sort of lives in the solar system. So we went, went down to Apollo 15 landing site and, and I felt her tongue or her, you know, her Gaia like structure saying it's too dry here. There's no, no way for life to be. I said, okay, follow me. <laughs> we went to Mars. We went to the equatorial area. We went to the poles where there was a little, there's water ice. There's a little melting here and there. She said, this could be, but it's also very tough here. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I said, follow me again. And we went to the equatorial area where one of the rovers, the original two rovers, one that's offline. I said, let's drop the belly pan on this. And you can feel, you know, this is all in a dream, but put your hand on this, on, on the belly, on the body of the rover. What do you feel? And she said, I feel life said, oh, okay. Uh, I said, what do you feel? And she said, I feel at least 12 members, 12 variants, and their, their bacteria dried out. They're asleep, but they're my finest creations. You know, they're the complex life. And I said, you see, us monkeys have brought life here. We can do it. Mm. We are doing it. So, you know, don't be so pessimistic. Mm. But anyway, uh, that was another thought experiment so do you think that mars because you said like mars may have ha had life in the past and it died what would have to happen for it to be sustained there well that's the problem it's already dead so right. to actually try to bring it to life is just inconceivably difficult mm -hmm. so what you would do and this is where shepherd comes in right so for since 1978 I was working on the problem of how do you create sustainable spaceflight where people and life can make, occupy many places in the solar system. And I was part of Jerry O'Neill's Institute in Princeton. You know, as an 11th grader, you know, I, was, I joined as a member. You just pay your dues. But I wrote them letters and drawings and designs, which mm -hmm. I also sent to NASA in 78, 79, 80. Um, with different ways, I realized that O'Neill was right. Planetary surfaces and moon surfaces are terrible, really pretty terrible places to try to expand civilization because they're dirty, uh, they're at the bottom of gravity wells, uh, everything is going to be like the movie The Martian, mm -hmm. stuff is just going to fail. What you want to do is build big structures in space that are clean, where you're collecting energy, um, you can just build incredible environments. So they came up with the L5 colony idea, this giant rotating thingamajig. Um, and that was very inspiring to me, but I thought of the practicalities to get there. And finally, three years ago, working with the SETI Institute astronomer Peter Janiskins and Julian Knott, who's the world's leading balloon designer, we came up with uh, Shepard, which is what you do is you say, if you want to live in the solar system, you have to make new worlds. But you can't make them by terraforming Mars, forget that. You'll go there for visiting for science, but you're not gonna live there. Uh, what you do is you put an atmosphere around a small world, which is an asteroid that potentially contains water ice. And you do that with a balloon. <laughs> Mm. A balloon, a membrane, just like a cell membrane. It's the same technology as life itself. So Shepard would approach the asteroid, you know, meet its orbit, and extend this with air beams, this balloon structure, which would close down at the end and seal up, you would hope. According to Julian, it's not rocket science, which is kind of a funny thing. <laughs> you, you shoot in some xenon gas, and the asteroid, which is tumbling at one RPM, stops within a day. Cool. In the gas friction, and then you start putting waves of gas toward it, and it'll steer it like a sailing ship and, and point it into your waves. Just very gentle forces, because these are consolidated rubble piles. You can't wrap a cable around them. You right. can't you can't really even land stuff on them. Right. Because you're gonna create projectiles and you know most ideas about harvesting from asteroids are real nonsense. Mm. So then you can steer this thing like a ship and impart small waves of pressure and move them. So you'd move move a 10,000 ton asteroid, 50% water ice to lunar orbit. 
And as you're moving it, you sublimate the, the ice to uh, gas, pull it in f off and fill gigantic tanks that are attached to your balloon. By the time you get to lunar orbit, you have a huge fueling station that you'd got just using solar power on the outside of your balloon, uh, the whole thing driven by solar electric power, an initial load of, of uh, xenon to get you out there, and then you're cracking water into hydrogen and oxygen. So is the kind of like vision of this then being like a, a way of extracting elemental resources from space mm -hmm. to sustain life in space in space and like learning this whole process, practicing this process eventually when earth is uninhabitable for life, that life is carried on. Kind of like Wally -E where <laughs> man, like Well, that's not not necessarily the the whole story. Okay. Because we're gonna we're gonna not destroy this world. We're just adapting it. We're in we're in the Anthropocene. We're survivors. We may have some issues in the future, but we're tough. We're gonna be here in ten thousand years. Awesome. So, but the question is, how healthy are we gonna be in three hundred years? And we're gonna be a lot healthier if we have an escape a valve, a pressure valve, which allows uh, humanity to have a new perspective. So, for instance. Uh, if you had, you know, 10 million people living in in throughout the solar system in these fantastically constructed environments, how many million, sir? 10 million or a okay. billion. I mean, yeah. there's really no end to it. Sure. Uh, because what you can also do with these asteroids is melt them to a liquid globule. The rocky bits will go into the middle, and they'll be like one of those glass spheres you can buy that has two shrimps in them and mm -hmm. algaes and stuff, and it just needs light. It's sealed, and it can go on indefinitely. So you can make a biosphere out of these objects. They're full of amino acids and fatty acids and carbonaceous stuff. They're, the building blocks of life are in these asteroids. And so you, you make a small world. It has an atmosphere. It, you know, it might be half a mile across. It's an ocean, basically, a globule ocean, and there's a ton of life in it thriving. It's lit by you know, LEDs on the inside. Uh, collected from energy on the outside. And now you have a sustainable biosphere that can support people and everything else indefinitely. You've made worlds. And if you had thousands of such things, you could have this enormous infrastructure and this enormous flowing out of human beings and just everything else. You, you might then have a shot at, say, living on surfaces of worlds like Mars. But you wouldn't necessarily have to. Right, because you'd have all these resources that you're creating in these shepherd type. Yeah, and the, the resources and the resources space. are dwarf what you could even consider ever mining from Earth. So, right. Earth now has um, where people live and where civilization can go, and energy. The amount of energy, the amount of resources is just enormous. It's a whole solar system. It's billions of times more than than we we can use on our own planet. So you take the pressure off the Earth. Uh, so if you want to keep reproducing and having kids with ever smarter phones, you need all those minerals, you need energy, you need foodstuffs. We just build new worlds. How accessible are these like these uh, different asteroids that are out there? Like, are they close enough? Are, mm -hmm. Like, can we get to them? What is we develop There's, our space technology more? Like, they're there by their billions, so they're tracking them. Like, there was okay. a, a comet nucleus that was five hundred. I think it was 500 meters that passed by the Earth this year that wasn't tracked. And I was like, whoa, look at that. There's a lot of pictures of it. Mm -hmm. um, so they're just everywhere. I mean, there's an entire belt of them between Mars and Jupiter that Jupiter holds in place. Mm -hmm. If Jupiter wasn't there, it would those would have impacted Earth and Mars and Venus. You know, that, that was part of this so-called late heavy bombardment. Mm -hmm. Uh, that Jupiter saved us by moving out and pulling all that material, which was from the formation of the source, and pulling it away from us. Mm -hmm. But they're an asset. That's not too far out. Right. Because we can get to Mars in six months. You go farther than Mars, you send an, a prospector mission, just like here in BC. You want to do a mining claim, you go out and you prospect, and you find a source of gold or copper or whatever, and then you go and sell your claim you know, to a developer mm. who then goes and develops it. So it'll be the same as the, the minerals business on Earth. You know, 
the people will fly these missions to find good, rich targets, right. ad identify their orbits precisely, because you need that, and then developers will come and develop them. How, <clears throat> how important do you feel it is to get a little bit more uh, community and synergistic efforts towards this sort of work, and like, how do you see that coming around? to get more alignment among the human species to really make this potentially possible if it needs to happen. Yeah, and it's it, it, it may be decades away. Right. So I'm realistic about this. Elon Musk, who announced plans to go to Mars, is, it's totally unrealistic. It's like having a conversation with Terrence McKenna. Okay. You know, yeah. e Elon has training, and he runs a company that does traditional boosters, but what he's proposing is, in, is completely fanciful. Okay. So when he... So my TEDx talk was aimed at Elon. There's a picture of Elon. He wants to colonize Mars, which in, on the surface is not even a good idea. It's not practical. Uh, it's not desirable. He's designed this enormous spacecraft in his head, which is not a good architecture at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not even using resources from space. They're going to have to launch a gigantic booster with a special tank. Mm -hmm. You know, and a private company which goes quarter to quarter isn't going to ever be able to afford to do this. And it's super high risk. It's it's not incremental. I wrote an essay, kind of a screed, you know, an essay yeah. against this just to put my feelings in the record. Right. I thought that there was a chance that SpaceX and Elon would small would run small demonstrator flights of a concept like Shepard. It may be somebody else. Mm -hmm. But... My job, in a sense, is done, and then I can't develop it on my own. So right. I have to find it needs about 15 to 20 years of low-Earth orbit demonstrator flights trying to catch golf balls and stones and then going for a bigger object and scaling it up, you know, going from something that's right. two meters across to 200 meters across. Right. Same technology. <laughs> Man, it's so cool talking with you. It's so, uh, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's just... It's just shit. Like I was saying, uh, when I heard you talk at the conference this week, it really shifted me. It's like it, like uh, it is like kind of going on a little trip, a little Indo <laughs> trip on myself. But it's like uh, you know, it's a uh, Damer medicine instead of plant medicine. <laughs> you know, it's awesome, man. Um, so your your podcast um, and your website, like, how do you? Is this kind of like you're you're using to get these sort of ideas out there a little bit and just see what sticks to people and yeah what I, happens. I i tend to like you actually i tend to put on different skins different outfits like mm. physical outfits load different cultural operating systems and go into different worlds yeah. and so i've been running five or six careers in parallel so i i did 15 years of work for nasa with 25 different grants wow so that i could develop that community and that understanding but at the same time the origin of life work is done with pretty top level chemists, Nobel Prize winners, pretty much in, in our little community and geologists and whatnot, mathematicians now are coming in. Mm -hmm. So you really, to do this kind of work, you have to engage fully in the real people. You know, if you have a brilliant idea that seems to be feel like you, we talked about this, humans are, are good at create any feel good idea, these weird sacred geometries and whatever. But if it's not grounded in what can be what is known actually, mm. or what can be tested, mm. uh, then it's just being lost in story. Right. And very smart people can create very cunning stories. So you have things like chemtrails and you have things like, um, you know, flat earthers. So we, uh, and, and they, they mislead a lot of people and waste yeah. a lot of time and energy. Yeah. And we, we did a comedy panel, by the way, Symbiosis hired, uh, take three presents to present a flat earth panel at the festival and it was Kumare you know, it was a comedian who made the movie Kumare and J.P. Sears okay. and me and Eric Davis moderating and several other people and we sent it up the river so some of these festival goers you know, thought this was a real flat earth panel because there had been one at the lightning in a bottle which was very controversial and lightning right. in a bottle retracted it basically issued an apology for even having it there which is a good sign right they basically said no to that kind of woo-woo. But then Symbiosis said, well, that's not enough. We're going to send this up. So we had a, a, a thousand tortillas handed out at one point, and people started winging them at me and 
and Kumari was trying to lead a meditation with the blueberry, the blueberry going down through the chakras with the syrup <laughs> toward the pancake, because I presented the pancake earth as an alternate theory. Yeah. It wasn't just the flat earth, and I'm in a lab coat with a flip chart. You can find this online, okay. flat earth panel at symbiosis. Okay. You know, it's really funny. It's like an hour of just complete... I think I saw it when I was looking online last night. I saw it. I didn't get to it, but... Uh, yeah, so that's the only answer to this nonsense, right? right. Because, But we have to save people from getting... We, when you realize how gullible people are, especially in, in the United States, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, you have to do something to fight against that. Right. Uh, because you lose good minds for four or five years who believe in you know, weird techno singularities or 2012 or the electric universe or all this or UFOs or, yeah. and you got to get them out because they're an asset. Yeah. And, and they always eventually pop out and they, they regret being so sucked in. Right. So what would you, we'll wrap this up because we've got to get you going on to your next event there. But, um, you know, just in terms of just the general people out there who have been introduced to you now from our audience and our community, um, I don't know, what do you want to just kind of recommend? Because I do look at you personally as like, yeah, someone in that that next generation, um, you know, and I don't want to say elder, but you know what I mean? Like, mm, like, getting gray here yeah, and there. Yeah, you've been around and like, you've done so many cool things and you're very open and like experimental. And I don't know, what do you kind of want to just maybe part on some people that are maybe listening to this that you could mm. share? Just whatever wisdom bomb you want to drop on us. But I think go into deep imagination. And the coolest thing that comes into your mind from somewhere that's not even really from you is your guide. You know, go quiet, go to nature. If you need to do entheogens, do entheogens. If you need to do yoga, do yoga. Go to that source. Don't, so, don't listen to what your friends say, <laughs> your mates, whatever. And go into that delicious world of what is delivered open space for that and then follow where that leads mm. question it you know don't go driving motorcycles off cliffs and stuff like that if that would be cool not necessarily right but um, allow the universe to talk to you and then be guided from that and take all the stepping stones that are sensible and doable uh, to take and it will take you to amazing places but like a little kid in your imaginative world in your bedroom or walking out in the, the field, you're open to the cosmos and to intention and to the interconnection of the field. And it, it's ready and waiting to guide you to really amazing places wherever they are. That's great. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And that's one of the kind of the take home points from this weekend and, and hearing you talk and meeting with you more for me is just and yeah, like letting myself go in there and embrace it. And like you kind of saying, turn and face it mm. and like present yourself, open yourself to it and like let yourself go into it. And I think that's great advice in terms of when you start to see in the, in the, in with your eyes closed or in the darkness or wherever you are in that stillness. And when you see the, the form start to come in, mm. tune yourself to that frequency and let it come more prevalent and then mm. let it present what it will or whatever and, your intention is. And sometimes it's a little tickle in your imagination. Mm. And then you get a whole thing that comes, whoa, and you can be open-eyed and it's like, oh, I'm running this really cool story suddenly and I'm just sitting on the bus. Or I, This used to happen to me when I mowed the lawn when I was a kid, like the vibration of the lawnmower or something right. did yeah. something and I had all these things like, oh my God, the spacecraft thing and, you know, weird things were happening just by right. mowing lawns yeah and that's kind of like the the beauty of going into a, a trance like state like flotation like flotation yeah like w whatever it is like going into that trance state um one i think is actually very healthy physically physiologically energetically yeah but then the imagination the creation process that can happen in there the insight the revelation whatever you want to call it there's something yeah, there too. it's so healthy. It, it's connected yeah. to spirit too. And it right. means that you're not alone. You're not isolated. Look at this amazing universe. And it's not necessarily that you have to be connected with people. You're connected with something, you know, that right. that is powerful and it's, it's loving and it's guiding and it's wants to entertain you too. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, that's um, Dr. Bruce Damer. 
the uh, visionary, wacky, computationalist. <laughs> Whatever I am. Yeah. Um, Damer.com, and that's where you can reach his podcast. And all he's got all his links to his his, his work, his, uh, his his videos, TEDx talks and stuff. So Damer.com, check it out. And uh, and connect with them too. Um, if you have, if you're one of those people that has like a vision, a crazy idea, send it to them. Just, Maybe yeah, it's uh, Bruce. This is why I, I I read this out on Joe's show, Bruce at Damer dot com, okay. and Joe said you're gonna get a lot of black dicks. <laughs> and I I had no idea yeah. what he meant, but it it, it came. Oh <laughs> my flood gosh. of black dicks. Oh gosh, yeah, I don't know if I'm allowed to Joe say Rogan dick on the, on the air up here. But. No, that's okay. <laughs> The Joe Rogan podcast, and you were on it a couple years ago in October 2014, I believe. And um, yeah, that's what you're going to get out of that. Op- I don't think you'll get any, well, you know what? I mean, people might prove me wrong, but I don't think you'll get any of that sort of stuff coming from our <laughs> community. Probably maybe just a, uh, well, I don't polite. know, what you Canadian, will, people. Yeah, Canadians are too polite. Yeah, too. exactly. But we have we have an international audience, and there are some uh, Roganites out there that listen to this, I know for sure, too. But Roganomics. Roganomics. <laughs> it's everywhere. It's spreading like the... Uh, that gelatinous field of the, the um, gel yeah. thing, yeah. yeah, it's part of it <laughs> somehow. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for coming on air. I really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully next year when you're back in town for the conference, we can do it again. Absolutely, squeeze it in. Yeah, man. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for listening, everybody. Really appreciate your support. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode or any episode of Vancouver Real, please uh, go and uh, maybe. Review us on iTunes, like us, share us on Facebook, um, you know, promote this type of media, promote this type of uh, open mindedness and, and, and just open agenda. You know, we're not really here to do anything other than just have this conversation and, and let it take seed and go from there. So if you support this, please help us out and spread the word. Uh, floathouse.ca, Floathouse is our sponsor here that makes this all possible. And um, that's another great modality to explore. And we need, uh, you know, we need your support with that as well. Always, it's um, it is a little bit of an uphill battle with floating and flotation and therapy. I can tell the listeners that it, yeah. he- it healed my back. So yeah, my back was shot. It was in pain. I'd written my PhD thesis. Floating healed my back. So that's really important. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and likewise, it healed my back as well. I had surgery a couple of years ago, and it helped me tremendously. And and it still does. It keeps giving back to me that space. So please support us at Float House as well. Recovery will save you 20% off the promo code. But I encourage you to get into a practice if you can. If you're local or find your local float center, it's going to be with Float House. Um, promote this great device in this great environment because it will be a part of our future that I foresee. Um, so again, thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, to whatever is.